You may not be familiar with private equity funds, but you probably own quite a bit of them indirectly via your workplace pension scheme. And that's a problem because these funds tend to sweep a lot of risk under the carpet. And at the moment, they may be harboring some big losses. So in this video, we'll look at the reasons why some pension funds buy these funds despite their high fees, but also what the returns on those funds might be looking ahead. Now, don't forget, if you do enjoy our content, please do subscribe to our channel and like this video. So let's look at hidden losses in your pension fund in a bit more detail. Let's begin with the definition of private equity. This is not a listed stock like Apple or Microsoft, which is publicly listed and trades on an exchange. These are companies which haven't listed and investments in those is much less liquid. It's much more difficult to sell an investment in a company which doesn't trade its shares on a stock exchange. So a private equity fund would invest in these unlisted companies, either by owning the whole of the company or some share of it. Private credit is a similar concept. This is just a loan made directly by a company to another company. That debt can't then be traded on an exchange, like a corporate bond could, for example. So this is used by companies to raise capital, and it could be to expand their company, it could be to make an acquisition, or it could be used, for example, for real estate development. So given the illiquidity, the difficulty of selling these investments once you've bought them, what's the attraction? The justification for investing in private equity is usually fivefold. As with any investment, we want high returns. And usually these are investments in very rapidly growing companies, usually quite small companies as well. So the private equity company has a very strong interest in seeing that growth accelerated. So it will provide capital for that growth. It may also provide some expertise in management to ensure that the growth is successful. Now, because this draws from a wider opportunity set than just listed markets, in theory, you should be able to generate higher returns if you select your growth companies very carefully. So as with any active management, this depends on the skill of the fund manager. Another frequently cited attraction of this market is that it has low volatility. The price fluctuations of these funds tend to be quite low compared to, say, listed stocks. Although, as we'll see shortly, that might be misleading. Related to that fact about low volatility is that private markets tend to have a low correlation with public markets. So they do diversify your portfolio if, say, you have a global stock fund. Now, I said in the introduction of this video that you probably already own some private equity. Let's look at the evidence for that. And all you have to do is to look at your pension fund's asset allocation. You'll find this in the fact sheets, probably on the first page as well. So here, for example, is a page from the university superannuation scheme. Now, I'm part of this scheme because I used to be a postdoc at Oxford University. Any academic will probably have a pension managed by USS, as it's called. And if you look at where they invest, you can see about a third of the fund is invested in private markets. So that would be both private equity and private credit. If we look at a huge US pension fund, this is the CalPERS fund, the California Public Employees Retirement System. This too has recently moved into the private equity market and the private debt market. You can see the private equity makes up 13% of their overall investments and private debt is smaller. That makes up about 5%. Now, why are these pension funds buying into what seems on the face of it quite an exotic asset class? Well, return is one reason, but actually there's another reason. And some people refer to this as volatility laundering. Now, because private equity and private credit are not traded publicly on markets, it's very difficult to see what the price of them is from day to day. So if you look at a plot of their value, it does tend to look quite smooth. So the guy who came up with the term volatility laundering is Clifford Asness. He's a quantitative analyst, he's a fund manager, and a bit of a legend in the fund management space. He writes some brilliant papers. And as a joke, he wrote this paper, which is called Introducing the New AQR Smooth Fund. AQR is his fund management company. It stands for Applied Quantitative Research. Now, the joke was that Clifford Asness said that he was going to take one of his standard funds and simply not tell investors its price except for every quarter. 
So as he says, this would give the same long-term return as his standard funds, but because he'd only give the price of the fund as a weighted average of previous prices, maybe over the last couple of years, that would reduce the volatility of the fund, the price fluctuations, because they'd be smoothed out and averaged over time. Another one of the benefits of that approach is that you won't get any of those embarrassing losses that you get with normal funds. So the volatility is still there, we simply don't observe it. And again, as a joke, Asner said that he could actually have a higher fee by not telling his investors the price of his fund, because private equity fund fees tend to be much higher than those of funds which invest in liquid markets. Robin Wigglesworth of the FT picked up on the joke and also published an article about Asnes's article where he talks about the phony happiness of private equity funds. Phony happiness refers to a comment made by a CIO of a pension fund in the US who said that we did know that our actuaries and accountants would accept the smoothing that the accounting would do. It may be phony happiness, but we just want to think we're happy. Also that he'd be in favour of it because it provides some smoothing effects on both reported and actual risks. You can see this smoothing in action if we look at the S&P 500. You can see how normally if you look at the daily prices, the prices fluctuate a lot. It's very volatile and risky. But if you're a fund manager, you don't like that. You don't like the fact that it falls quite significantly some of the time. What if we reported the value of the S&P every quarter, say? You can see that now it looks kind of blocky, but the volatility is still pretty high. Notice the fall in 2022 when the US tech wreck happened. However, if we look at the quarterly prices, but we also smooth by taking the average returns over the previous two years, suddenly what was very risky and very volatile looks nice and smooth and has very low risk on the face of it. So you can immediately see why there's a clamour amongst pension fund managers to buy these private equity funds. By having low volatility, they look like they're low risk. But a lot of that low risk is illusory. It's only low risk because of the smoothing and because of the fact that it's difficult to measure the volatility and the prices of the assets of these funds. So what is the value of the stuff which is owned by one of these private equity funds? Well, it's not like a fund which owns publicly listed shares. If a fund owns Apple stock, for example, then you can literally work out from minute to minute what the value of that fund would be. You just take the number of shares it owns and multiply it by the stock prices, which you can read from the stock market itself. So this gives you the idea of mark to market. What is the value of this asset in terms of today's markets? This is a very easy question to answer if the stocks are listed on an exchange. But ask a private equity fund what the value of its assets are and it's much more difficult. And to quote Clifford Asness again, you wouldn't think the question would be particularly tricky for them. Private equity fund managers are, after all, expert in valuation. That is, of course, if they actually wanted to tell you the answer, and if you actually wanted to hear it. Remember, many of these pension funds don't want to know about the volatility because it makes them look bad, and it takes two to do the non-marking tango. In fact, this has the Financial Conduct Authority very worried. If there are some big losses being hidden inside UK private equity funds and private credit funds, it wants to know. So it's launched a review to weed out poor practices in some corners of the private equity market. Now, my partner Laura tells me that some of my videos are quite technical and difficult to wade through, which I find very hard to believe. But for some people, having a podcast, which is just a kind of light-hearted conversation between two people, is easier to digest but still educational. So if you want to listen to our podcast, which deals with investment trusts, a very similar topic to this one on private equity, then you can find that on your favourite podcast provider. The name of the podcast is Many Happy Returns, and you can find a link to it in the description of this video. Now, what's certainly true is that the fees for private equity tend to be very high. Now, many of them use a 2 and 20 fee model, where they charge 2% of the assets under management every year, and that's independent of performance. They get that whether they outperform or not, and then they take a fifth of any outperformance if they are very successful. Now compare that with an S&P tracker, which you could probably buy for about 0.05% fee, and that's an order of magnitude more expensive. 
In fact, it's probably worse than that because there was a report by McKinsey in 2017 which showed that the fees were probably closer to 5.7% in total. The ongoing fee was higher than 2%, it was about 2.7%. The performance fee, which is called carried interest in the private equity space, added about 1.9% to that. And then the partnership expenses for the company which actually managed the fund, this is to pay for things like legal costs, that added another 0.9%. So these are unquestionably egregious fees, and you will be paying these if one of these funds is held in your pension. Furthermore, you can also buy funds of funds. These are private equity funds that invest in other private equity funds. And of course, the joke is that funds of funds are fees on fees. So on top of that 5.7%, you can add another 2.1% to get an all-in fee for these funds of funds of 7.9%. So given these very high fees, does the outperformance of private equity justify the fees? Well, the evidence seems to suggest that's not the case. We're seeing diminishing returns for private equity over the last several years. This is a paper from 2020 which looks at the expected return on public equity. So this is the stuff you buy on a normal stock exchange, perhaps via an index fund, which is a very low fee. That's the light blue line which you can see here. And there the return seems fairly steady. It's at around 4 or 5% per year. And these returns are net of fees. Now, private equity did outperform very significantly in the 1990s and the early 2000s. However, since 2006, it seems as if those expected returns have fallen significantly. Why is that? Well, there's a lot more interest in private credit. So lots of money flooding the market and not enough opportunities to invest has pushed up valuations and probably reduced returns in future. Added to that, at the moment, we have much higher interest rates. And some of the performance for these private equity funds comes from leverage. They borrow money to invest money and amplify their returns. The cost of that leverage is now higher, and that'll be a drag on return in the future. Now, in the UK, you can buy, as a retail investor, a normal investor, you can buy some of these funds directly in the form of an investment trust. And I've shown the returns for some of the largest investment trusts going back to 2004 in the graph beside me. You can also see the FTSE All Share, which is an index for all UK stocks, and the FTSE All World, which is a global equity index. And certainly over the last two decades, yes, many private equity funds have outperformed public markets. Certainly not all of them. It depends on which sector you got exposure to and the quality of the fund manager. But notice also that that outperformance seems to have dwindled over the last couple of years. For example, since 2022, I could only find one large UK investment trust, which is a private equity investment trust, which has performed particularly well, and that's 3i. So in summary then, there are a number of problems with these funds. The first one I'd say is a lack of liquidity. If there is a shakeout in the private equity market, your fund manager will be trapped into that asset class as valuations fall. Another reason why I don't like these funds is that their valuations lack transparency. Hopefully the FCA review will improve that, but I think if you're just making up numbers and there is a degree of subjectivity in these valuations, you'll always be biased to try and make your fund look good. Even if these fund managers pay a third party to do an independent valuation, they're paying for that, so there is a misalignment of interests. But the thing which I probably dislike most about private equity funds is their incredibly high fees. These will be passed on to you because if your pension fund buys these funds, and of course they'll be tempted to do so for the reasons we've seen, the volatility laundering, then of course it's you who's going to be paying those fees. And then finally, in this world of higher interest rates, I think that there's going to be a headwind for these private equity companies and they may not be able to deliver on their promise of outperformance. Now, you may be absolutely fine with owning private equity as part of your pension fund, but just in case you're not, you may want to find out if that's the case. It should be easy. Just go to the fact sheet for your pension fund, look at the asset allocation, as it's called, and look for the words private equity, private credit, private markets to see what proportion of your cash is invested in those markets. And if you're not happy with it, well, just tell your representative at work that this is really not for me. Ultimately, you can take action against what your money's invested in and you have a voice.
Now, don't forget that we do have our podcast and we did discuss something along these lines about investment trusts. And if you want to hear that, you can find it from your podcast provider. It's called Many Happy Returns. And as always, thank you for listening.